as at the beginning of our session, Roy Kishoni from the Technion, Israel Institute of Technology, uh, who's gonna talk to us about coexistence and stability in antibiotic-mediated microbial communities. Okay. Um, thanks, Daniel, and thanks um, for organizing the for the organizing committee. Um, I actually noticed that um, you were wise enough to invite um, Kalina Vetsigian Vets from uh, previously from uh, my lab. And in discussion with him, uh, I thought uh, he would be a much uh, more perfect person to tell you about this story. Um, so I'm actually gonna change the title on you guys, okay? And instead of that title, um, I'm gonna switch to this title. And, um, I'm going to tell you about uh, some studies that we do on trying to understand evolution of antibiotic resistance and evolution towards other stress that bacteria encounter, both in the clinic and both in the lab and in uh, in the clinic. So we know that antibiotic resistance is going as a, a major public health concern. This is a quote from the World Health Organization saying uh, a post-antibiotic era in which common infections and minor injuries can kill, far from being an apocalyptic fantasy, is instead a very real possibility for the 21st century. So with that motivation and, and other, we're really trying to, to look in, in detail how bacteria evolve resistance uh, to antibiotics in laboratory setting, in the clinical setting, how they evolve resistance to uh, to other stresses that they encounter within, within our body. And then to think about possible ways by which we might be able to intervene, slow down, perhaps even reverse that process and drive evolution backwards in time. I'm, my, most of my talk is gonna be about this uh, first uh, part, and I'm just gonna touch with a few slides at the end about uh, possible ways to counteract resistance. Okay, so how do we study evolution of resistance in the lab? And I'm, I'm mainly going to focus on evolution through de novo mutations. There's, of course, another mode of, of evolution, which is acquiring horizontally transfer acquired resistant genes. But I'm going to focus this talk on acquiring resistance through uh, de novo spontaneously appearing mutations and selection. So typically, if I want to study that, I'm going to take bacteria, put them on a, on a plate, Resistant mutant is going to appear, and I'm going to pick up this resistant mutant and see what's there. So this is great. It's great if you want to see the first adaptive step towards antibiotic resistance. But if you want to be able to see how bacteria keep accumulating more and more mutation to become more and more resistant, we need to keep ramping up the selection pressure, ramping up the antibiotic stress as the bacteria evolve. So I want to show you uh, two different uh, devices, kind of I like to call them uh, benchtop evolution devices that allow us to do that. One in which we're going to increase antibiotic concentration in time, and the other one kind of in a well-mixed environment, and in the other device we're going to increase antibiotic concentration in space, and in both of these we're going to let bacteria evolve high-level resistance by acquiring more and more mutations this time. Okay, so here is the first device. We call it the Morbidostat. It's kind of a continuous culture device kind of like the chemostat or the turbidostat, if you think about it. Uh, but instead of the bacteria being limited by a limiting uh, nutrient, instead they are uh, limited, the growth rate is limited by drug inhibition. And the way that works, there's a computer that co constantly monitor how fast the bacteria are going. If they're going too fast, it adds more drug. If they're going too slowly, they lose the drug out. So the bacteria are always kind of partially inhibited they go like that. At one point, resistant mutations arise. They take over in the population. The population starts to go faster. The computer see that, increase the drug concentration, 
and uh, in, inhibit again the, uh, the population, and the process repeats itself, new mutations arise, and so on. Um, okay, here's kind of a cartoon that ex kind of, uh, I think, explains a, a much more vivid way what's actually going on. It's from a review by uh, Natalie Balaban. It's essentially kind of a walk a mole, but every time they come, we kind of hit them harder. Growth rate is constant, right, but not nutrient limited. Low, low conservation constant, right. Okay. Here's the implementation of the device. We have multiple tubes like that, each one fed with multiple um, uh, sources, with um, drug free and, uh, and um, drug free media and media with uh, antibiotics. And there is uh, optical density meter on each one and that fed to a computer and that which decide what to do at any given moment. So when we take bacteria and put them into okay, into these uh, devices, we see really a fairly dramatic increase in antibiotic resistance. We see some, in this particular case that I'm showing you, which is a uh, evolution to trimesoprim, diadrofolic reductase inhibitor, we see some 1,000-fold increase in resistance in the MAC, in the minimal inhibitory concentration, and we see that that increase does not happen through one big step, but rather through accumulation of multiple mutations. Each one provides uh, a, a mild uh, benefit, but together accumulating to, to a large effect, and you see those individual mutations accumulating here. So about four or five mutations accumulating. You can also see that process happens fairly fast, so some two or three weeks of selection we get from, uh, we get this large increase of 1,000 fold, and you can see that every time we repeat the experiment, we get fairly similar adaptive paths. We never get a path that kind of stuck in the middle. They all reach about the same uh, high level of uh, antibiotic concentration. At that point, we are almost at the solubility limit of the drug, so we, we really just cannot add more drug. Um, trimesoprine. Yeah. So the uh, DHFR inhibitor. Right. Uh, but we see similar patterns for, for many different drugs that we've tried. Yes, please. The population size is um, about 10 to the 9, I would say. About 10 to the 9. It's a large population size. You can see that we are walking here right at the limit of uh, um, mutation limited. Right. So for us, here we are kind of almost like there's a period of stagnation waiting for mutations to appear. So we are right there at the population size. For other drugs, we don't quite see those steps, so we are not mutation limited. And that I'm going to show you in a second, you'll see the very different um, target size for mutations that appear for different drugs. Okay, so that's uh, the first device that I was talking about. And of course, what we want to do is sequence these and along the way and see what are the trajectories, genotypic trajectories that we see. But before that, I want to show you this uh, second device that I've mentioned, which uh, we call the mega plate. It's a microbial evolution in Gauss arena. Um, what it is, it's essentially a petri dish, but sized up to about the size of like uh, a desk. And we pattern it with slabs of increasing amount of an antibiotic and simply put bacteria on the sides where there is no antibiotic and let them swim towards uh, ever increasing antibiotic gradient. Is there a way to dim off the light here? Anyone knows? The god of light? No. Sorry. Not on my side. Oh, it is. Um, ah, it lights. says lights. Good. Okay, it's good. It's good. Thank you. <laughs> and then I'll do all on afterwards. Okay. Okay, so here is a plate. And um, in this particular experiment, it's set up in a symmetric way. There's no drug on the side, and drug concentration, again, this is a trimesoprene, the same drug I've shown you earlier, is increasing towards uh, the middle, again, increasing by a lot. This is just about 
of drug needed to kill the bacteria, 10 times more, 100 times more, 1,000 times more, and we're going to put bacteria here and there and let them swim. This is just condensation on the lid, so just ignore that part. Okay, so I'm going to put the bacteria, let them swim, and I'm going to stop the movie here. So what happened? They grow in the area that is drug-free, they're very happy, that's very easy, they actually chemotact. So they, they get stuck on that line, they, they depleted the nutrient where, where there was no drug, and they kind of only go to the area with drug, but they get stuck on that line because every time a single bacterium go in, it gets killed or inhibited by, by the drug. Okay, so the only way to go in is through evolution, and if I play it, you'll see mutant uh, appearing and giving rise to whole lineages, like in here and on the other side, giving rise to whole lineages that penetrate, they get to the second uh, step. Secondary mutations appear, these mutants are now capable of going a 10 time fold, the concentration, the process repeats it, itself 400 fold and 1,000 fold uh, increase in drug resistance. The whole video is, um, sped up, the, this experiment took about uh, 10 or 11 days to run. So there, there, are actually two, there are actually two reasons why we take a very large, large plate. One is related to the question that was ask, just asked earlier, is to increase the population size and therefore the probability of mutations. But the second is to uh, avoid or at least to minimize a lot the effect of diffusion because the bacteria swim linearly with time and diffusion go like square root of time. When you have a large plate, the diffusion doesn't do much. But yes, there is some little diffusion going on in the plate. Let me run it one more time. I personally enjoy seeing this movie, so I'm just going to enjoy it with you. And I think what happened with, with that video, besides being a very uh, strong uh, scientific tool for us to follow multiple um, trajectories to antibiotic resistance, um, it also, what it does, it takes concepts in evolution that are fairly vague in our mind, it's surely in the, in the mind of, of the general public, concepts of mutation, selection, uh, diversification, competition, in, clonal interference, and mainly, probably most importantly for the general public, antibiotic resistance and just how quickly it can happen, and takes all of these concepts and puts them in kind of a um, seeing is believing uh, demonstration that is... Hmm? The, the time, the whole thing took 10 or 11 days. Everything I've shown you is, is 11 days. It's, yeah, it's, ah, time is linear in this book. Yeah. yeah. Um, this uh, video, we published it some half a year ago or something. It was viewed over 24 million times. Just to tell you that there's something I, I found it uh, kind of um, very educating for me how visualization can, is in fact very important to, to communicating science and, and concepts that are, tend to be fairly vague and uh, obscure. Okay, so when the experiment is done, we open up the lid and we pick up mutants every time there's a funnel like that. And then in one uh, experiment like that, we can trace many different trajectories leading to, to high level resistance. There are beautiful phenomena that happen here, such as, yeah, if, you, if you look here, there's uh, the mutants that penetrate and compensatory mutations that appear. There are uh, mutator allele high, that increase a lot the frequency of mutation that also appear in some of these lineages, and so on. And if we look across the trajectories, we can map in a fairly systematic way, what, are, what is a collection of pathways that can lead to antibiotic resistance for, for many different drugs. This is actually from the morbido study, but a, sim, a similar picture appears also in, in, in the mega plate. We see that for some drugs, there is a fairly large target of alternative genes, alternative pathways that can be mutated to allow resistance. And for other drugs, like trimesoprim, almost all the mutations appear in one particular gene, the target of the antibiotic, and they even tend to appear in exactly the same residue, exactly the same 
uh, position in, in the gene. It is in, in these zygs that we are somewhat on the, on the limit of mutational limit, and in these zygs, uh, you don't see the, those steps anymore. There is much more potential to, to go. Okay, so uh, that particular drug for time supreme, it's kind of interesting. So you run evolution many different times, and essentially you get almost exactly to the same solution. It's a, it's a genotypic level, it's a amino acid changes level. If you look at what actually happened, these are, tend to be um, all of this mutation in uh, the active site of uh, diadophilic reductase, the target of, of the antibiotic. And you see that each time we run the experiment, we get kind of partially overlapping um, f uh, final uh, states of uh, the evolutionary trajectory. Not only evolution gets to very similar solutions, it gets uh, in um, a fairly similar uh, order in which mutations are required. So here, if we follow the order of mutations by actually sampling from a population multiple clones over time, this is in the, in the mobile stat, you see that, for example, if you, look, if you look at these two, they require the same color, the color stand for the different residues changes, they require the same mutation and in exactly the same order. And overall, if you look, there's a strong signal for conservation of order. It's not uh, strict, but there is a tendency for if two mutations appear, let's say mutation A and B appear in one replicate of the experiment, it's quite likely that I'm going to see these two mutations appearing in that same order in another replicate of the experiment. Okay, I'm actually going to remind myself to turn on the light here. Let's see, good. Okay, so what, what I've shown you so far is uh, first those devices, benchtop evolution devices in Mobido Stat and the mega plate that allow us to trace evolution, multi step adaptive paths uh, uh, leading to high level of resistance. We see fairly dramatic increase in drug resistance in these uh, machines. We see some 1,000-fold increase across two or three weeks of uh, selection. And we see that for some drugs, and not for others, there's some uh, signal of reproducibility, of uh, conservation of the um, final uh, state towards which evolution is going, and even of the order of accumulation of mutations. So what I want to do next is to focus on, on this idea of Parallel evolution, if you wish. Same thing happen over and over. Again, not for all drugs, but for some drugs. And try to generalize from that. And I would say that when you see a pattern like that, two things happen. One, it gives some sense of predictability, right? We know what will happen before it actually happens, or we have some good guess, good idea of what might happen before it actually happens. So maybe we can prepare for it, maybe we can kind of anticipate the evolutionary process. Again, not for all drugs, but for some drugs. And second, if you see a pattern like that, same mutations appearing over and over and over, you say, huh, these mutations must be very important. They must be um, the drivers of the evolutionary process. They are not appearing by chance. They are not hitchhiking mutations. They are not appearing by drift. These are the important mutations that are required for adaptation in these particular conditions. So what I want to do next is to take this very simple concept, parallel evolution equal or signifies adaptive um, mutations, is a signal for adaptive mutations. Okay? I want to take that concept from the very, base, very simple environment of bacteria in the tube to the much more complex environment of bacteria uh, growing within us during infection. But this, the concept is, is very similar. We're going to ask what mutations appear when bacteria go and infect multiple people, and which of these mutations appear repeatedly, or which genes get mutated repeatedly in multiple people. And these are, would be candidates for the genes that are important for the bug within that particular environment. So to do that, we need to follow 
bacteria as they go and infect multiple people, and we need to follow the same strain or the same, even the same clone as it goes and infect multiple people. And the, the way to, to go about it is to look for cases like that, and that essentially happens all the time when a pathogen go and spread in the population, or the, every time we have an outbreak or an epidemic. Right? But we have the same, uh, or almost the same clone going and infecting multiple people, and if it uh, starts colonizing and uh, forming a long-term infection, we can follow the evolution of the bug, of the same bug in different people. Right, that for some drugs you get very, mutations are very specific, and for other drugs you take you see mutations that are, the, the target size is much larger. And I think with respect to, if I try to pinpoint more towards what you're asking, for these drugs it's, it's more likely that mutations providing resistance to one drug would also cause cross resistance effect to another drug. Is, is there a typical sequence? Sequence in time? I would love to know the answer to this question. Uh, this is some, something we're actually thinking about right now. And uh, right, because I think the, the question of, we know, actually know a lot about just taking bacteria, putting them on, on an antibiotic plate, picking mutants, and asking are they resistant or sensitive to other drugs. Okay. What I think we don't know is if you keep going, whether those more specialized or more gen generic uh, mutations tend to appear first or, or last. And I think we have an opportunity to do that with either one of those devices. Uh, I don't know the answer to this question, but I, I, we are actually thinking about it quite deeply. Okay, so we looked for a case like that of a small outbreak and focused on an, an outbreak of uh, a bug called Bocoldea dolosa, fairly rare pathogen that in fact um, primarily people with cystic fibrosis, whose um, lung is much more, um, the mucus is much more thick, and they are prone to infections by many bugs. And sometimes, actually not often, they get uh, infection with that bug, Bocodea dolosa, that is um, really quite, uh, quite dangerous. It, uh, it goes and infects from patient to patient. Uh, it's very hard to treat, cause long-term infection, resistant to almost all known antibiotics, and often after several years, uh, unfortunately, makes it from the lung to the bloodstream and cause sepsis and, and death. And because of the severity of this uh, disease, the hospital that we worked with, the Children's Hospital in Boston, kept uh, clones, isolates from multiple people that were infected across, across the, um, time, actually across uh, some sev several years, from uh, the lung in blue and from blood in, in red. And all of that was sitting in, in the freezer. And what we simply di uh, did was to take those uh, clones from, uh, from the minus 80 and sequence them. And first thing that you see is that mutations actually do appear, do accumulate over time while within patient, during, during infection within patient, this kind of, kind, of, kind of a sense of a molecular clock, some two clicks per, per year that get, a, a, get accumulated. And that, of course, led to diversification of the, of the strains within, uh, between the, uh, different patients. And we can actually use these mutations to then reveal the underlying uh, phylogenetic tree that connects those multiple isolates that were collected from, from different patients. The patients are labeled here uh, with light color on the back, and here is uh, the phylogeny. Okay, so now what we were asking, we were asking, can we find uh, mutations or maybe specific genes that get mutated repeatedly in different patients? And here is one such gene, GYRA. It's um, the target of one of the antibiotics used in um, in treatment of these patients, uh, ciprofloxacin. And you can see that for that gene, besides the wild type allele, there are actually four other different alleles that are labeled here of uh, amino acid, representing different amino acid changes. 
And because we have a phylogeny, we can actually count how many independent de novo mutational event gave rise to that diversity, right? So all of these appeared from one, but this orange one appeared through one, two, three, four, five different de novo mutation. Actually, they appear in different patients repeatedly, right? And altogether, we can say, hey, that gene got mutated one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different time independently in different patients. So when I see something like that, I'm going to say, wow, that's very strange, right? So there must be something important going on. There must be uh, selection acting on, uh, on that gene. Selection for what? Well, in that case, I can um, quite easily guess. It's probably selection for resistance to the antibiotic, to ciprofloxacin, and we can test that in the lab, and that's exactly what, what happened. If we measure resistance, all of the ones that got uh, in any one of these mutations increase resistance actually by quite a bit, quite a bit by 10 or even 100 fold compared to, to the wild strains. So more, if I want to generalize from here, I basically just want, want to, to ask um, my analysis, to ask my, my algorithm, give me all the genes that have such a pattern, that are mutated repeatedly in multiple patients. It turns out that there are not too many, some 17 genes like that. And I want, I want to show you the list. But before that, you might want to ask, is it possible that genes, these genes actually um, have higher signal, higher chance of mutation, not because of selection, but rather because of hotspot for, uh, for mutations? And to tackle that question, we looked at the rate of non-synonymous to synonymous substitutions in genes that got mutated multiple times, the candidates are candidates for selection compared to all other genes, and you see very strong in-reach for non-synonymous changes in genes that get mutated re repeatedly in different patients. So what are these genes? Here they are, and when you look at it, essentially you see uh, the hallmark for pathogenicity. You see, uh, antibiotic resistance, like, including the genes, uh, the gene I've shown you, uh, the gyre A, but, but other genes representing resistance to other antibiotics. You see outer membrane uh, changes in, in the outer membrane uh, st structure, which is important for evading immune response and for resistance to hydrophobic antibiotics. You see genes related to secretion. And one thing that was actually surprising to us, but, actually, but in fact appeal to be the most mutated across almost all uh, of our patients is a two-component system for oxygen sensing. And when you think about it, actually, in retrospect, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, you have the pathogen coming suddenly to the lung, low oxygen, very low oxygen, also fluctuating oxygen environment. And it seems that the main thing the bug is busy with is sensing oxygen and um, regulating gene expression based on on oxygen concentration. If I, if I try to summarize from here, what that approach allows us to do is to really look from the eye point of view of the pathogen, what are the main selection pressures that it sees, that it encounters, what are the main challenges that it needs to overcome during infection with, with inpatients. And we can read that information just by looking at, at the genomes, or in fact, by looking at the diversity of genomes across multiple patients. Okay. But if you follow it, uh, everything uh, and the, the premise of uh, how we've laid down the, the foundation for, for doing that, it is based on comparing evolution in the, uh, multiple in infections in different patients. But what if I have a different scenario? I have a single patient coming, coming to the clinic, and I want to identify, kind of a, I want some diagnostic tool that would tell me on that particular single patient what are the main challenges that the bacteria are facing. Can we still do something about it? And the answer is we might. We might if evolution within patient doesn't look like that, but does it look more like that? If Evolution within a single patient is actually uh, based on um, mutations not 
taking over, not sweeping to fixation, but rather leading to diversification and multiple lineages coexist and co-evolving within any one single patient. If that was the case, then we can ask what mutations appear in that lineage, what mutations appear in that lineage, and are the mutations that appear repeatedly in two lineages within the same, the same patient. These would be the signals for positive adaptive evolution. So in some way, we, we want to ask, is evolution within the patient more similar to evolution in, in the morbidostat, well-mixed device that I've shown you, or is it more similar to evolution on the big plate, the mega plate? So, to, excuse me? Say again. The, we cannot say for sure. Um, we kind of make that assumption in some way, and it's consistent with what I'm going to show you, but can I rule out that it actually got infected with multiple strains? Um, I think if it got infected with multiple strains that are different enough genotypically, I can, I can recognize it. If it got infected with multiple, I wouldn't even call it strains, but different clones of the same strains, uh, maybe it's going to be hard to, to, um, to reject. I, 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 I'm going to try to, to touch on that in, in, in a second. Yes, but it's a very good point. It's, it, I think it's hard to, to, it's hard to, um, to reject the possibility of multiple clones slightly diverse infecting uh, a person, but, um, but I think the, the data is consistent, perfectly consistent with that phenomenon not happening. Okay, I can say that. And, and let me just also add, if, if that part did not happen within the, the patient, but rather these two clones came in, I can still ask the same question. Do these two lineages uh, evolve in parallel? So in some, in some way, I, I'm actually, I care a lot about this question, but in some way it doesn't, it's not going to affect what I'm going to show you. Okay. Again. The, what I'm citing there is actually a review that presented that question. Uh, that's what I'm citing here, but it, um, most of the studies on CF are with uh, Pseudomonas. The, studies, the study I've shown you earlier was, uh, like I said, with Bocoler Dolosa, with Dolosa, uh, fairly rare, and I'm going to show you one, one other pathogen in, in a second. But still, within, within Dolosa, we went back to these patients and said, okay, what is the diversity within a single patient? How do we do that? Instead of the standard clinical practice of streaking and picking one colony, we're going to streak and pick many colonies. Okay? But essentially, we take a sputum sample from, from the patient, spread it on a plate, and we actually do one of two things. We either pick individual colonies and whole genome sequence them, or we scrape the whole plate and deep sequence it to find uh, the diverse locations. And what we see, so here's what we see. This is one particular patient, but similar things in, in different other patients. You see that the population is actually very diverse. Right? So these are different clones taken at the same single time, same clinical sample. Very diverse. In fact, if I try to reconstruct the phylogeny of these clones from a single time point, and because I have the molecular clock of the disease from what I've shown you earlier, I, I can date it to about, uh, uh, in this case, nine years, which is what we know about the time the patient got infected from, uh, with, with that pathogen. So again, that's what, uh, where I said it's consistent with uh, infection with a single clone. Only very few mutations uh, actually fixing, fully fixing in the population, and since then, diversification and multiple lineages coexisting for, for ages. Coexisting. No, this is, uh, that's uh, all, all the mutations. All the mutations. The, the phylogeny is based on all the mutations, and the molecular clock is based on all the mutations. Right. Okay. 
Okay, so now given that that's a, that's a picture, we can ask other mutations that appear repeatedly or genes that get mutated repeatedly in, independently in different lineages within the same patient, and the answer yeah, is yes. And not only that, the answer again is that these genes and not others are enriched for high ratio of non-synonymous to synonymous substitutions. So, the, so the, the picture we kind of want to have in mind is, is the following. It's kind of similar to, to the picture of, of, of the mega plate. Sometime in the past, a stress appeal, a new antibiotic is being used. Okay. Because the population size is so large, multiple different clones discover a way to, to overcome that stress. Both of them go in, in, in frequency, but neither of them take over, and diversity maintains itself uh, for a long time. What maintains the diversity? Well, could be clonal interference, could be that these are actually very similar, could be some uh, cost feeding, could, meet, could be diversification in space. I can, I'm gonna touch on that a bit. The real answer is we don't know, but independently of the, of the mechanism that keeps those lineages coexisting for such a long time, independent of what is the mechanism, it's just a case that because that is a phenomenon, we can come today and in a, a single clinical sample that we take actually contains information. We would say the diversity in that single clinical sample contains information on past selection pressures acting on that population within that uh, individual. With that idea, we can now go and start assigning genes under selection, not at the population level like before, but at the single patient level. And you can see some of these genes, like the gyre that I've shown you earlier, are shared between many patients, but some are patient specific and may represent stress that are unique to that patient, maybe uh, have to do with specific metabolic requirement, with specific treatment, with uh, specific uh, challenges of uh, innate immunity. Okay, so what, what did we do? We took the concept of a parallel evolution and we said, what are the genes that evolve in parallel at the whole population level between different patients and identified drivers of selection of the epidemic or the outbreak as a whole. We then zoomed in and say, given that there are, oh, oh, as, as we found, there are actually multiple lineages coexisting within a single patient can we use parallel evolution in these lineages to identify patient-specific selection pressures? Okay. Now we can actually keep going deeper and ask within a given organ or within a given site in the lung, are there specific adaptation, are there kind of site-specific selection pressure or site-specific uh, uh, adaptation that, uh, that allows the bacteria to overcome challenges that are unique to, uh, to the very specific location in which, uh, in which they are um, proliferating. How do we do that? So we were actually uh, fortunate enough to have one of uh, um, the patients agreeing to give us um, his explanted lung after a lung uh, transplant uh, surgery, and we took that lung and did uh, many, many small biopsies, cross-section, biopsy, cross-section, many biopsies like that in the lung. Now, this is actually not with uh, the bugs that I've shown you earlier, with the loss, but rather with uh, stenotrophomonas maltophilia. But you'll see actually a very similar uh, pheno phenomena of diversification uh, happening in, in that bug as well. So from each of these sites, we collected multiple uh, clones, arrayed them on a plate, and looked for phenotype, antibiotic resistance, and for uh, genetic diversity. What do we see? S again, very similar. Again, this is a single patient now multiple location in, in, in the lung, but again, in a way, single patient, single time point. And you see, again, huge diversity, multiple uh, very distinct lineages with distinct phenotypes of antibiotic resistance coexisting. In that patient, you also see mutations that again repeat between 
uh, those different lineages, the same, the same mutation, again, representing um, stress attitudes, say, are probably important for resistance to, to antibiotic and giving rise to those, uh, the differential profile of resistance to antibiotics. Okay, but now, unlike in the previous case, we actually have the distribution of those clones in the lung. Okay. So, first thing you want to ask is, what happened? There are two lineages here. How are they distributed in the lung? Left lung, right lung, or a different location, or the different lobes? Okay. So here's the answer to that. The answer is that mostly, not always, but mostly every uh, site that we looked at, even the tiniest one millimeter biopsy, actually contain diversity that almost like represents the entire diversity of, of the lung. Okay? It's not separated in lobes, it's not separated into the two lungs. There are some sites like in here that are clonal for one of the lineages, but mostly sites tend to be um, diverse and contain clones representing those uh, different coexisting lineages. Because that happened, right, just like we did in, in the single patient level, because we have diversification within a single patient, we can do selection pressure acting within its patient level. Now, because we have diversification within a single site, we can do the same trick and ask what are, are there any genes that evolve in parallel in those different lineages, yet are in parallel and independently in those different lineages, yet are um, co-localized um, co to the same sites? Yes. Can't hear you. Mm. Right, right. Um, I think it's a very good hypothesis, but I'm not sure they have evidence for or against. Uh, yes. Okay, so here is one such gene. It's very interesting, very interesting. MERC uh, implicated in, in uh, metal resistance. And you can see this is the entire collection of sites that we have, tw uh, 20 sites. And you can see that almost in all sites that that gene got mutated in the pink lineage, okay, it also got mutated in the green lineage. Okay. These are obviously completely independent. There are two different lineages acquiring mutation in the same gene and in the same site. Okay. So when we see something like that, we say, ha, ah, that's a signal for two things, for um, adaptation selection, but that is site-specific, representing overcoming challenges that are unique to, obviously to that patient, but also to specific locations within the body. Okay, I think I'm almost like converging here. We are done with a part of selection. I, there's one more story that I'm actually gonna, gonna skip, but I've just put that slide here to say that diversity of the pathogen within a single uh, sample not only allows us to say a lot about the selection pressures acting at population level, patient level, single site level, but also allows us to uh, identify a transmission network of who infected who with, at the population level and at the single patient level. And you can, you can imagine looking at ancestry that, we, uh, that that's uh, possible, and it, it's really enabled by looking at not at single clones, but rather at the diversity of the population. So I think if I try to summarize what I've uh, shown you is that the genome of pathogens taken from, uh, from the clinic contains, uh, contains beautiful information if, 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 you, if, you, if you know how to read it, right? So if you give me a genome from that, uh, from the Dolosa um, uh, epidemic outbreak, right? I can tell you what date it was isolated. Right? It kind of has a molecular clock stamp in it. Right? I can tell you which patient it came from. I can tell you who infected that patient. 
And I think, in a way, more importantly, I can tell you what are the selection pressures, the main challenges that the pathogen experience at a population level, at a single patient level, and within patient at a single uh, site level. Some of these have to do with uh, um, resisting, uh, resisting uh, treatment, antibiotic, antimicrobial therapy, and other have to do with other challenges that the bugs see within our body. And, and we think moving forward that we can even use that information to, to say not only what the pathogen is capable of doing today, but also to kind of foresee the future, say something about anticipating what will happen next, what are the next uh, genetic changes that we might anticipate if we were to use that antibiotic or another. Okay, where is the uh, time is done? Okay, so I'm actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end here. I'm gonna end here, no talk about that. Uh, just thank the many people uh, involved. I, I'm really very, very fortunate to work with uh, amazing people in my lab, uh, starting at, at Harvard, and now we're moving to the Technion. The part that I've shown you with um, selection, the evolution devices, if you wish, is uh, a work started with Erdal uh, Topak, Adrian Veres, Adam Palmer on the um, Morbidostat, and uh, the mega plate uh, was really spearheaded by uh, uh, Michael Bame with uh, help from Tammy Lieberman, and now continue in my lab in Technion with uh, Otem Gross and Idan Yelin. And um, the, with inpatient evolution, I'd say this is where you really need amazing collaborators at the clinic, and I was really very, very fortunate, and very fortunate to work with Alexander McAdam, Greg Bilby, at the Children's Hospital, with Ted Cohen and Doug Wilson on uh, work that they uh, went through very quickly on uh, tuberculosis, and that work was uh, spearheaded in the lab with Tammy Lieberman and John Baptiste Nipschel and Hattie Chang, and... Um, now continuing with Olga and Daniele. Okay, thanks much for your attention. Thank you.